Good morning. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And happy fall. I mean, officially Tuesday, right, is our official fall, and it is fall like out. It's a beautiful, crisp morning. A special welcome to our guests, both here in person and those joining us online. Thank you for joining us to worship and praise our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is Pastor Scott Maxwell. I have the honor and the privilege to serve here at St. John Lutheran Church, right here in Linthicum, out just outside Baltimore. And this morning, I'm joined by our intern, the vicar Karen Pugach, and she will bring us the word of God in the sermon. We pray that as we are gathered, whether in person or online, that this will be a time that we can celebrate God's never failing love, forgiveness of sins, reconciliation of relationships, and the promise and hope of a new tomorrow. We hope that you feel welcomed, whether you're here in person or online, and that our time together, we trust, will fill you with, every one of you, with a sense of joy and peace. We are streaming live this morning, but please be assured that the worship service will be recorded and available later in the day. The entire worship service will be on the screen here. We no longer print bulletins as they are a touch point, and we're trying to eliminate as many of those as possible. Our responses today will be in that mustard yellow color. Thank you to, to everyone who has made today possible, our teams, our, including property and worship, our ushers and greeters and cleaners. And if you'd like to help with an upcoming week by volunteering, please sign up as you register by clicking one of the add-ons. Uh, special thanks to Alina Antonenko. How did I do? Antonenko? All right. She's from the St. Christopher's Episcopal uh, Church. She joined us this morning to share her musical talents. Welcome, Alina. And of course, thank you to Jacob Parks, who does his magic over there to allow us to stream online. And if you'd like to help him or learn how to stream and post up onto YouTube, uh, please see Jacob or see me. Uh, update on our, uh, our continuing uh, work with St. Christopher's Episcopal Church and in in, uh, seeing what type of partnership we can be in ministry. Uh, yesterday, uh, late afternoon, I guess, uh, the Synod Council, the Lutheran Synod Council, voted to call Corey Bergman. He will be the associate pastor for both St. John and uh, St. Christopher's. Uh, pastor Bergman will be ordained in maybe a week or so. And, uh, and then he has accepted, it'll be a part-time call. He's accepted the one-year term. Uh, his primary ministry will be to preach and preside at St. Christopher's. Uh, but we'll try to find ways to get him over here so we can get to know him as well. We'll have more information forthcoming on that. Uh, some prayer and care updates to share with you. We pray for uh, Betty Gallion. She's recovering from a fall. Uh, Loretta Geisler, who is hospitalized. We pray for uh, Jenna Marcella and uh, Kim Porter, who's here, all the way in the back. <laughs> Upcoming uh, surgeries. And, uh, and for Pat Hudson, she's uh, uh, having some health issues, and she has an upcoming surgery as well. So please keep those people in our prayers. Let's see. Upcoming events. We've got uh, this coming Saturday, we serve dinner at the Women's and Children's Center uh, down, um, shelter downtown. Um, there was a link in Wednesday's Word on Wednesday uh, to sign up if you can contribute to the meal uh, and things to sign up there. Uh, those will be collected between 3.30 and 4.30 on Saturday afternoon in the parking lot. Uh, Vicar Karen will be doing a sneak peek Bible study. So what's a sneak peek Bible study? <laughs> she will be looking at the texts that we read for Sundays, but on Tuesdays. So the upcoming Sunday, she'll have a Bible study. That'll be online. That'll start first Tuesday in October. More details coming out on that. And also upcoming in October, October 4th, we're going to have a, you know what? I put those up there, sneak peek, uh, Tuesdays, 1230, beginning in October. And then in October, we'll have a blessing of the animals. And that'll be over at St. Christopher's. It's on Sunday, the 
October 4th at 2 p.m. So bring all your critters. Uh, Vigor Karen promises to touch all the lizards and spiders and snakes. And I'll do get dogs and cats. That's all. <laughs> This morning, uh, we have our gospel reading from Matthew that narrates one of Jesus' controversial parables in which Jesus says that the reign of God is like that of a landowner who pays his workers the same wage no matter what time of day they begin to work. We also will hear from Jonah when God changes God's mind about punishing Nivea and for their evil ways, Jonah gets angry. Now, I wonder if we get envious about God's extravagant generosity. And so in her debut sermon here at St. John, Vicar Karen proclaims the gospel in a generous helping of pie. I'm not sure where the Holy Spirit is leading Vicar Karen with her message, but if it has to do with pie, I'm in. <laughs> As we enter into worship, I invite you to open your hearts to Jesus. As we are given an opportunity to come before our Lord, confessing our sins, known and unknown, and then we hear and receive that incredibly, incredible grace-filled, freeing words of forgiveness. We're invited to stand in body or spirit as able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. We keep silence for a moment of reflection. I invite you to join me, faithful God. Have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go on our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to live in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God hears the cries of all who call, in, who call out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. All, all your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you show perpetual loving kindness to your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. We're invited to be seated. Sorry, no video. You just get me today. <laughs> A reading from Jonah. When God saw what the people of Nineveh did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is, that is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah 
went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it to come up over Jonah to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor or which you did not grow. It came into being in the night and perished in a night. And you should not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also many animals. The word of the Lord. Our second reading is from Philippians. For to me, living in Christ and dying is gain. If I am to live in flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in this flesh is more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is what God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite Vicar Karen forward. The Holy Gospel this morning is from the 20th chapter of Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing wanting work in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. And he went out again about noon and about three o'clock and did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others wanting work. And he said to them, why are you standing here wanting work all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last 
and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought they'd receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last worked only one hour and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to the Lord Christ. Please be seated. Ugh. Please remove that slide. <laughs> and I ask you if you, I, please pray with me. Gracious God, your word surprises, challenges, upsets, and overturns our way of seeing and thinking. Come find us today wherever we are, however we are. By the power of your Holy Spirit, cause that which is withering in us to blossom, and that which is exacting to broaden until we see you, and thereby glimpse the kingdom you are bringing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So I have a t-shirt collection. This is just a small sampling of the t-shirts collection. Now many of my shirts were acquired from the ELCA youth gathering or from Synod youth events that I've attended. Some are funny, some just caught my eye. And I have to say that um, more than one of them uh, attests to my flamingo obsession. <laughs> but lately things have changed. Oh, I, I wear my church shirts, especially the one that proclaims, beware the prophets. But my shirts of late are intended to send a message. Since I don't envision participating in mass gatherings of people who are pe peacefully protesting for justice anytime soon, I wear my heart on my sleeve. My current favorite says, it's right there in the middle, equal rights for others does not mean fewer rights for you. It's not pie. And I think this is a good shirt for this morning's gospel. It speaks to us, and I think it speaks to Jonah, who knew that God is merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. But he just didn't want those Ninevites to experience that love. It speaks to those workers who were hired first, whose expectations of abundance were met with disappointment, because in God's economy, the bookkeeping works a little differently. In the kingdom of God, it turns out, everyone gets all the pie. Everyone. In Greek, parable means a comparison, but in our lexicon, it's come to be a story that teaches some moral principle, maybe even more than one moral principle. And like all ancient writings, these stories often speak to a specific situation. And like readers of all times and places, we are accustomed to reading our own context into each of them. These are often subversive stories told to get us thinking about our relationships to God and to one another, about the systems that govern our human way of life and the earth-shattering, status quo, upending way that the kingdom of God functions. We often read parables as allegory, and that's certainly true of this one that we've named the parable of the laborers in the vineyard. And so we identify ourselves uh, with the people who are doing the work in this story. 
And allegorically, vineyards have come to represent the kingdom of God or Israel. And of course, this landowner, this generous landowner, he represents God. Like all good parables, the character in this, characters in this stories don't always behave the way they're expected to. And the resolution seems a little bit crazy. We know that the boss doesn't typically run over to Home Depot to gather day laborers, and certainly not multiple times in a single day. But that does sound like our relentless God seeking after us lost sheep. And in our economic system, part-time workers do not enjoy the benefits full-time workers expect. The landowner's generosity is unimaginable, but the worker's response is not. Those first hired upon seeing the amount the last are paid revel in the expectation that they're going to get paid more. After all, if you get a living day's wage for one hour's work, how much more will a full day net? Now I imagine that they're already enjoying a vision of the day off they'll be able to take because of this unexpected windfall. Maybe the lavish meal they'll prepare for their family, perhaps the small amount they can hide away for a rainy day. They look at the situation through eyes that are great, productivity with self-worth, longevity with priority, with human eyes. But their calculations are incorrect. They're yanked back to reality when in fact they receive the amount they had agreed upon in the first place. Nothing more, but nothing less. And they're outraged at this perceived slight and they let it be known. How can it be that these latecomers who they judge as being worth less are made equal. It's just not fair. Now, I don't know about you, I, I have six kids. I've heard it's not fair more times than I would like to, uh, you know, count. And I think every parent, right, every parent has some pat response to it. You know, I have friends whose favorite response is, a fair is a place where you bring pigs to show. Right? Is that one of yours? Anybody use that one? It's kind of a Midwestern response, pigs and fairs. My response has always been um, that everybody doesn't get the same. Everybody gets what they need. Um, but that response really doesn't work in this case, does it? Because what everybody needs here is the same thing, a living wage. And it is, in fact, what these workers all get. But the first hired workers, they're letting their work, or more pointedly, how long they've worked, define themselves. Their work becomes more than what they do to feed their families. It has become their identity, that which defines their very value. And somehow, it's also come to cloud their sight. In the estimation of these first hired workers, these last ones, they don't really deserve to live. They don't deserve a living wage. They haven't done enough. And despite the fact that many hands make light work, and as more workers are hired during the day, these first have less to do, they're still really upset. Even this reduction in workload makes no difference. They just haven't done enough. They don't deserve what they get. It just doesn't add up. Now our generous landowner disagrees with the bookkeeping of these workers, pointing out that he can do whatever he wants with his abundance, using the word friend. Now this word for friend is found only two other places in Matthew's Gospel. Once for a wedding guest who we'll hear about in upcoming weeks, who appears at the wedding wearing the wrong clothing and is booted to the curb. And Jesus himself uses this word as he greets Judas in the Garden of Gethsemane. My friend Jason would be screaming about how important tone is when we read the gospel, because here, that tone is very important. 
The landowner is not greeting his good bunny, buddy. He is calling out this worker's envy. He's calling out their inability to see the good in the situation, how the community benefits from the actions of the other's workers, reduced workload, increased production, and that the landowner's generous payment enables all in the community to have their daily bread, or pie as the case may be. Now, in Greek, this attack is kind of an idiom. And um, it is translated that uh, these, these workers are not jealous, but that uh, they, they see this landowner as looking out through evil eyes. The landowner says to them, I've lost my place, forgive me, that, um, that they can't see the goodness because they can only see the evil. Is your eye evil because I'm good? Is what he's really asking them? So ask yourself this question. The first hired workers are not looking through the good lens of the kingdom. They're peering out through those darkened blinders of human nature. They see from their own place, their own place of privilege, because they were hired first, and they feel that they've been harmed. These disgruntled workers who've set them up for, subs up for disappointment, they're sent away. They're sent away, but with their daily wage sent away before the landowner can get really, really angry with them. Now we too, we welcome the abundant grace of God, don't we? It's generous, it's given to us all freely. But just like Jonah, and just like those workers, if we're honest, don't we all grumble when those who don't live up to our standards get it as well? Isn't that just human nature? Isn't that why following Jesus is no easy walk in the park, but the backbreaking work of harvesting all day long in the hot sun? The scandal for these workers and the scandal for us is that those who have done so much less work, they're just made equal to us. God's grace and generosity are beyond our understanding, and that is indeed good news. Good news for us, and good news for all of creation. So pass the pie, because there's plenty of it to go around. But what if this parable isn't just talking about who gets into heaven and God's generosity? What if this parable is speaking to our current situation? What if it co could be about economics, actually about economics? This parable speaks to us right here in our own country, where the gap between the haves and the have-nots is made increasingly apparent by this pandemic. Right here, where people often conflate their net worth with their self-worth. Where the point of view and experience of those with power and privilege are centered, and the cries of those who are on the margins are met with disbelief, or even fall on deaf ears. Here in this nation, where immigration is still front and center, where day laborers still toil to put food on the table and a roof over their children's heads. Today, where fear and uncertainty are present in the lives of so many who are wanting to work but aren't hired, or wanting to work and forced into quarantine, here where comfortable people argue about $600 that could actually make or break other people's lives, where the lack of a living wage along with affordable housing are major causes of homelessness, in Jesus' day, those lacks were major causes of death. And I wonder just how far apart from that we really, truly are. 
The accounting system that is set up in our world is flawed. It's flawed from God's perspective because there's just too much red ink. What we and these workers fail to understand is that Jesus doesn't call us to make comparisons and judgments about the worth or worthiness of others. Jesus calls us to make disciples. As theologian Thomas Merton writes, our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. That is not our business. In fact, it's nobody's business. What we are asked to do is to love. And this love itself will render both ourselves and our neighbors worthy. Jesus calls us to live in the generous grace we have been gifted that we do not deserve, calls us to live in freedom, to care for those who struggle under systems of oppression, right here, right now. God's grace and generosity are not fair. If they were, or we too would be in the outer darkness. God's accounting system is different. It makes little sense here in this world where wealth and power are things to be coveted and to be held over the heads of those who have neither. Unlike the landowner who is generous this one day, I believe God desires the systems that support injustice in all realms to be dismantled. And then what would it look like to live in a world where no one struggled for their daily bread, where everyone had a roof over their head, where worth was based on our humanity, not the color of our skin, the size of our paycheck, or the amount of privilege and power that we wield. A world where everyone worked together for the good of all, not for some wealthy, powerful landowner who, no matter how generous, is really looking out for their own self-interest. A, a world where God's bookkeeping prevails, where grace abounds and generosity is the currency of the day and everyone's envelope contains the same amount. In the kingdom of God, everyone thrives. Everyone gets all the pie. Everyone. Amen. I invite you to keep your seat and enjoy our musical selection. Shane. 
I invite you to stand as you are able in body and spirit as we join together confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. drawn together in the compassion of God. We pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Generous God, you make the last first and the first last. Where this gospel challenges the church, equip it for its works of service. Strengthen those who suffer for Christ. Lord, in your mercy, Sun and wind, bushes and worms, cattle and great cities, nothing in creation is outside your concern, mighty God. In your mercy, tend to it all. Give us a spirit of generosity toward all you have made, Lord, in your mercy. Where we find envy and create enemies, you provide enough for all. Bring peace to places of conflict and violence. Inspire leaders with creativity and wisdom. Bless the work of negotiators, peacekeepers, and development workers. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Reveal yourself to all in need as you, gracious, as, are, as you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, ready to relent from punishing. Accompany judges and lawyers, victims of crime and those serving sentences. Give fruitful labor and livelihood to those seeking work. Lord, in your mercy. Even beyond our expectations, you choose to give generously. Grant life, health, and courage to all who are in need. We pause now to lift names to you, Lord, either out loud on our lips or in the silence of our hearts. For Pat, Jenna, Kim, Betty, Tammy, Loretta, Mary Kay, Jenna, Rusty. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We are invited to be seated. 
Again, this morning we are not pastoring the offering plate, another touch point. Uh, we have, of course, the Little Red Church over here to receive your offering. For those that uh, would so choose, you're welcome to give online at our website of sjlc.org. We thank you for your continued generosity to our vision and mission and ministries here at St. John and as we develop our partnership with St. Christopher. Let us pray for those blessings and generous gifts from God. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. You have set before us these gifts of your good creation. Prepare us for your heavenly banquet. Nourish us with these rich food and drink. And send us forth to set tables in the midst of a suffering world. Through the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you now to, uh, I hope you picked up a cup on the way in for our communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us share in that meal. We take the body of Christ, the body of Christ given for you. Amen. And uh, carefully open the cup here, maybe off to the side so you don't get it on your clothes. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand in body or spirit. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with the food beyond compare, the body and blood of Christ. Lead us from this place, nourished and forgiven, into your beloved vineyard to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst, guided by the example of the same Jesus Christ and led by the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Amen. Receive the blessing. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen. Amen. And our call to serve. Let us go into the world led by Christ, sharing love, serving all. We have still the peace to say, but I do have one announcement to share with you. As you came in, you noticed that uh, Tammy was not there the, today or last week. Please keep Tammy in your prayers. She is very, very sick. Uh, she is hospitalized. So um, I've been in contact with her mother in North Dakota, and um, so we're uh, having a call around and I'm going to try and see if the hospital will let me go in this afternoon. So please keep her in prayer. 
Let us go forth in peace, remembering the poor. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Thank you for coming. See you next week.